This is episode number 444 of the Health and Fitness Podcast. I in a fight brought to you in association with Smith Street Paleo. Go see them, hop over, get a food plan. If you live in Dubai, that is. If not, just hop over to the website, smithstreetpaleo.com, and please give them some love. I'm joined today by a guest on the line from London, Miss Sophie Grace Holmes. I enjoyed the show. Really hope you guys do too. Enjoy. Welcome back to another edition of the Inner Fight Podcast, and I am absolutely pumped to be joined on the line from London by Miss Sophie Holmes. Sophie, thank you very much for joining us. How are you? Morning, afternoon. I'm very well, thank you. Very, very well. You've just told me that you've been running around Mayfair with a backpack on. Why would you do that? Yeah. Well, I'm going to pitch you the scene. So I had a client this morning yeah. at 8 o'clock. Right. And I had a client by the sea in Essex at 6 o'clock. Wow. So the only way for me to get from A to B was to run between the stations through rush hour like a mad woman with a backpack <laughs> and the snacks. <laughs> as, get time. as you do. This is an incredible story and I can't wait to really get into it over the next half an hour or so, mate. But give us a little bit of a background because your life started early. I'm going to leave it at that. You tell us what happened. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good way of describing it and a way that's never been described like that before. But (laughs) being told from a very young age that I basically wouldn't be here by the age of 16 meant that I had no choice but to absolutely live life like a crazy person, but to the fullest doing the things I love, which probably wouldn't fit with most people because I'm an extremist. But... (laughs) I have my CF to thank for that. And actually, I'm now only 27, so 11 years later, I am still here running about like a crazy thing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's incredible, isn't it? And I, I think this is, this is something that I'm, I'm sure you massively agree with. Like, we get told at a young age that we're going to be something or because of a certain medical situation that life might not unfold the way it is, but you seem to have dedicated and continue to dedicate your life to proving everybody wrong. Yeah, and I kind of like that, you know? I kind of like the fact that, one, I'm different. Two, I absolutely love doing things most people hate. Yeah. And also just proving that you bloody well can do it, and you can do anything you actually want, but it's just people saying you can't. And I've taken the attitude of, if you tell me I can't, I will do everything within my power to prove that you can. (laughs) I don't think you're different to, to, to a couple of people out there, but you are the opposite of a lot of people out there that do believe what the doctors say. Now, you were born with cystic fibrosis. Talk to us a little bit about that and how it affected you or does affect you or doesn't affect you. Okay, so cystic fibrosis is a genetic condition. So you're born at birth and both parents have to carry the faulty gene. Right. For me, it predominantly affects my lungs and digestive system. And I'm going to admit it's not the most glamorous of diseases. Right. It's basically the buildup of mucus within your body. And if I didn't exercise and didn't eat right or didn't treat it with the medications, it would just eventually kill me, basically, to put it plain and simply. Wow. Um, so, obviously, it takes a lot of daily dedication, like, obviously, the gym, 80 medications a day, but I'm willing to fight it to basically have a bloody good time. So you've been on medication since you were, since you were born, basically? Yeah, so I've di- I was diagnosed a bit late, so I was diagnosed at four months old. Yeah. And I was 10 weeks early as it was, eager for life, clearly. <laughs> and obviously my, my mum and dad were absolutely terrified because they were being told they were bring, basically bringing up a baby to die. Wow. When, how do you think, let's talk about the impact that maybe that had on them because that's, that's quite a scary thought, isn't it? Oh, 100%. Like, I have no idea how you even comprehend anything like that. But I think they took the negative with the positive and thought, you know what, we've got to make the best of a bad situation. And, you know, over the years, they fundraised the CF Trust, you know, well over £100,000 wow. and met so many friends and people. And, you know, I drive them absolutely mad with all my ideas. So what more could they want? <laughs> that's, that's very true. Well, at what age were you when you realized that, or when it became apparent, or when, when you un- understood that you had cystic fibrosis? It's a really interesting question, you know, because, you know, I went through school, I was winning in all the sports teams, because I'm very competitive, I have to win everything I do, and I <laughs> was seeing all my friends, and like, I was like, oh, I'm fine, I have no idea what they're banging on about me and having cystic fibrosis, what the hell? 
then I turned 19 and dramatically my health had a massive impact on my, my life and ended up in hospital for two weeks and I was like, right, so this is what it's about. Okay, I get it. Really? And the doctors basically turned and said, oh, okay, well done, so if you've got to 19, um, but it's all down here from, here, from now. Probably wow. have about five years. You end up on the transplant list and that'd be it. And I actually laughed. I was like, mate, you don't know me at all, do you? Wow. So I sat and drew off a bucket list of like 200 things and I was like, I'm going to be ticking off every single one of these and wow. I'm going to come back to you and prove that I can get better. And so I, basically I did exactly that. <laughs> That's quite phenomenal because I think a lot of people have a bucket list or create a bucket list, but it's it's something that maybe is sometimes more of a wish list. And yeah, 100%. Maybe I'll get round to those things, but this thought of maybe like life isn't guaranteed did that that must have inspired you massively to make it a real bucket list that you're actually going to get done, right? Oh, 100 percent. I think one of my biggest bugbears is people saying and not doing. If you're going to say, just go and do. Yeah. Like we have limited time here, and actually, I was speaking to a client this morning, and she said, "So, I'm nearly 40." You're 26. I suggest you just go and bloody live. She was like, I turned 40 nearly. I'm 40. What's yeah, happened? Yeah. And I was like, you're right. Like, I know I do that anyway. But people just say they're going to do all this stuff. But I've dedicated myself to saying, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. But I'm going to do it in the most extreme version I can. Yeah. That's, I mean, mate, hats off to you. That's an, it's an incredible attitude. But what was it? What was it like when you were, when you were sort of younger then? Like, was your, have you always had this energy? Have you always had this sort of can-do attitude and I'm going to do and I'm going to win? Or, like, how, how do you deal with it when, when you are a youngster and, and you get told those things? There must be a tough time. Like, there must be part of it that is quite challenging. Oh, don't get me wrong. The, having to do my medications every single day is yeah. a challenge in itself. Like... I, people think I'm like laughing at me. I'm like, oh, I get up at half four, five o'clock every day to right. make sure I get them done, and then I get on with my day. Because wow. otherwise, as you know what it's like, you get on with your day, time goes by, and you're like, wow, like it's bedtime. Like that's just kind of the way my life goes. Yeah. But you know that that I've got it down to a T because Miss Competitive here has to compete against herself all the time. So I've got my medication regime down to seven minutes. <laughs> mate I, if, if, if you can talk us through that because I, like it's very easy to say yeah i take medication every day because some people are thinking yeah well i take a few different pills or vitamins every day but this is something that keeps you alive what's your seven minute routine on keeping yourself alive okay so um the first minute involves me making a coffee <laughs> yeah it's coffee to get through it then i will go and grab my nebulizer uh, which takes a few minutes it's basically a drug that um, helps open up my airways. Yeah. Then next, I'll be taking an inhaled medication, but there's 20 capsules, and you have to break every single capsule one by one. It's so <laughs> tedious. <laughs> Honestly, I sit there, and I'm like, okay, let's do this now. Let's go. Really? So we do that, and then um, we have another inhaled one, which is 10 tablets, so we yeah. do that straight after. So the reason I do it in that order is because the first one um, – basically breaks down the mucus in my lungs. The second one is an antibiotic to treat for any bugs that may be in there. Right. Then, um, once that is done, that's like a pre-breakfast, then I have to take tablets every single time I eat. So some of them are throughout the whole day. Wow. So that, that's where the numbers add up. So I have to take about 50 of those in an entire day. Wow. So before you eat anything, you have to take medication. Yeah, because my body basically does not produce digestive enzymes. So if I didn't, I'm not. I'm going to spare you the details of the consequences. Wow. However, <laughs> it is a bit <laughs> manic. I can imagine. But then obviously I have a bunch of vitamins and things like that to take. So my body just does not digest or absorb things properly. So then that bumps all the way up to 80 by the end of the day. Wow. And how? At this, when did you start taking all of this medication? And how old were you? Well, it started as soon as I was diagnosed, four months old. But obviously, when I was a baby, the, they yeah. didn't trust me with tablets. So it was like either open up capsules in my mouth or um, buy nebulizers on, and masks and things like that. <laughs> Mate, I, to I can empathize with you on the nebulizer because when I had my accident a few months ago, I had to have one and it was, I literally had to have it on for not even five minutes a day, twice a day. And I hated every minute of it. So I can, yeah, you get it. You get it. I can. I mean, when I was in hospital and all this stuff was coming up, and yeah, it's pretty gross. It's um, but yeah, that mate, that that process. That I mean, it it's become part of your life. But how how is it emotionally like going through that? Do you have days where you're like, oh, I just I just 
wish I didn't have to do this or how do, like mentally it must be quite taxing it is you know what for the first time ever I actually sat there the other day and I was like wouldn't it be nice just to go to the gym just to train rather than go to the gym or go and do something extreme simply to stay alive yeah I can't comprehend what it must be like just to go to the gym to, to obviously I love training yeah. so I wouldn't do it but what it must be like to go simply just to train but out of enjoyment yeah. rather than go to train specifically to keep myself alive. Like I, It was one of those passing thoughts that kind of, I didn't really spend much time thinking about it, but I was like, oh my God, I, I suppose that's what the normal person does, right? <laughs> Well, is it? I mean, let, let's jump into that because you now, you do, you work with people, you motivate people, you train people. And, and that's a lot of, of, of what we speak about on the show. It's sort of people's motivation. So give us your thoughts on like, should everyone have a big goal? Should everyone be going to the gym to prepare for, to climb their next big mountain? Or is their motivation somehow different? I don't know. What's your thoughts? I mean... There's a lot of people that say to me they wish they had the motivation to do big things because the experiences are incredible. Yeah. And for me, challenge is everything. So, you know, if I put myself through a big mental and physical challenge, it's not the challenge itself, really, or or even completing the challenge. It's what you find out about yourself in the middle, in the middle of the, the pain cave when you're yeah. knee deep in there and you have no idea whether you can put one, step, one foot in front of the other, is those moments that actually make you realise how strong you are, like what you actually want out of life and you know what you're about and even what your next challenge is. Yeah. And people say to me they wish they could get themselves in that mindset to push themselves to, to that point to experience that because there are so many people that aren't willing to even find out what they're capable of to, I don't know, even 50%, yeah, let so, alone 90%. So, so how do they get, how do you get in that mindset then? Do you know what? I think it's really sad to say, like, it almost takes a near-death experience. Mm. Almost. Or something close for them to happen or something big for them to happen for them to realise that you've only got one shot at this. So, you know, you've just got to either bloody well live or just not. But I realise also some people aren't interested in pushing themselves to extremes, they're happy just to have the nice little five, two point yeah. five kids, normal life. Like that's absolutely fine. But so long as that's what they want, rather than they're just settling for it. Yeah, I, and I wonder. I, I, I'd be interested to get your thoughts. Like, how what percentage of people actually do want that, and what percentage of people are just settling for it? Like, so I, th- I think some people they're super happy, or are they? What's what's your what's your thoughts? Do you know what? Because I think I'm realising more so than ever, like the more people I meet who are outside of what I'd call the extreme activity circle in terms mm. of pushing themselves, doing these big challenges, I think there's more people that are just happy to have a normal life, but I don't really do mediocre. Yeah. And I'm, obviously a lot of my friends are happy to have that, but then they do sit there and in awe being like, but you've summited Kilimanjaro, you're the second person in the world to summit with CF. Yeah. You've done that. And I'm actually going to climb Mont Blanc next week. Unbelievable. And doing all these other things. And they're like, there's a part of them that does wish that, but I think there's also a bigger part of them that is happy just to have their house, their kids, their marriage, all of that. Yeah. Which is absolutely cool, but it's not I just you. feel like there's such a big world out there to explore. Like, why not explore it in a more an unordinary way? Yeah, yeah, and I, mate, I, I agree with you. I just, I just hope that, and, and that's why we do the show as well. We just hope that a lot of people might be that sort of normal person that you referred to there, and you've painted a, a great picture of the nine to five, the two point five children. Absolutely love it, and hopefully by by listening to the show and also listening to your story today, they can they may might jump out of it, mate. Let's let's jump into some of the challenges you've done you dropped a couple in there you've summited Kilimanjaro you're going to summit Mont Blanc talk to us about the the, the process why let's start with Kilimanjaro why did you start there how did it go how was the training with your condition all of that stuff I want to hear all about it okay so Kilimanjaro was the biggest challenge I set myself when I was 19 when I got told that basically I was going to die Right, as you do. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what can I do? Like, I literally Googled, like, challenges and was like, oh, cool, like, what, what is it that I want to do? And I was like, Kilimanjaro. And my parents were like, yeah, 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 kind of, like, pat me on the head. That's nice. I was like, no, no, like, I'm actually being really serious. I think it's possible. I think I can do it. Yeah. So my mum was like, okay, well, you've got to get doctor's clearance. Like, that is the only way. And I said, yeah, but if I don't, I'm still going. 
because I'm a bit stubborn like that. Right. <laughs> I spoke to the doctors and they all said no, but one doctor who is a Mantineer herself, and she said, look, if you if you think that you can do it, then I'm going to support your every step. But the moment you think that you can't, yeah. then you've got to phone me and you've got to come home. And I said, but the difference is you've just given me clearance, but I'm not leaving Africa until I've done it. Yeah. So that's great. So I thought, right, so I've given myself 12 months. I've given myself loads of time to train. I um, recruited a few people that didn't want to do it to do it with me. Um, lucky them. And <laughs> then decided, I was like, right, I'm going to set my sights on this. You know, it's like when you're training for a big challenge, you know, you have to commit. Yeah. So I started training in an altitude training mask. I don't know if you've ever tried one of those. <laughs> I actually remember, I think I've brought this up on the show before. When they sort of first came out or they first were blowing up a, a, quite a few years ago, I went to a DIY store and I, I bought a painting mask. And it was like this really high tech one that cost about five quid, and I trained in that once. <laughs> it was an absolute oh disaster. You just giving me the most random image in my head of you training. <laughs> yeah, in, in, a, in a ma- it was. I think I still have a picture of it. It was so village as well. It sort of, it wouldn't it, like it wouldn't tie properly, and it was just an, a lit. It was literally to stop fumes coming in, and I think it stopped everything coming in. But that's oh, that's gosh. part. So <laughs> that's completely off top. Well, it's partially on topic. So you've got a training mask, basically. So basically, I said to my consultant, he was like, what do you think of these? Do you think they'll work? And he was like, oh, for goodness sake, Sophie, I've told you once. I'm going to tell you twice, you can't fix this. Right. So I was like, oh, right. So I was like, you're so negative. I can't deal with you. I was like, look, I'll come back and slam some results on your desk in three months. So I phoned a guy um, called Charlie Pedler at St. Mary's University and said, he's a physiologist. And I said to him, do you have some spare hours? I'd like to do a VO2 max test, a lung function test, now and in eight weeks' time. Right. And he was like, what is it about? And I said, have you seen these? He was like, well, I don't know much about them, but let's see if they work. So I went and did my initial testing and then went away, did eight weeks worth of training, went back. I had a 20% improvement in both. Wow. Wow. That's so pretty solid. Massive. So I was like, okay. So I was like, oh, can I print these results out? So I went back to the consultant, handed them to him, and he shook my hand. He was like, fair enough. Yeah. He proved me wrong. So then I then went to him and said, will you now let me go and climb Kilimanjaro? And he was like... I still don't think you should do it, but I guess I'm never going to stop you. What were they worried about? They were basically saying that, because obviously I've got a lung condition, yeah. that the altitude and the temperatures and stuff could affect it, but in terms of permanently. Right. And I kind of said to them, I said, I completely understand the risk, but what I'm not willing to do is form an excuse and regret not trying yeah. over something that may not happen. Yeah. So... So, and he was a bit like, okay, fair enough. So, obviously, off I went to Kilimanjaro. And in, t- in out of our entire group, I was the only person that didn't get altitude sickness. My stats were 90% at the, at the summit and basically ran the way down. Wow. So, what? it just proves what you can do when you actually think about it and you actually dedicate and put your mind to it. That's what I was going to say because I think a, a lot of people, when, you know, when they'd have heard that, I mean, you essentially were risking your life doing... This was the first sort of this was the yeah, first mountain first the first time you go to this altitude like you're putting your life at risk right yeah exactly and a lot of i mean di- didn't that feel discomforting at any point or there must have been something going through your mind that was potentially a little bit like well what's the wor- worst case scenario is actually i die like <laughs> the problem is with that is that i don't actually fear death right what I actually fear is not doing something or not actually pushing myself to see what I can do out of the fear of failing. Amazing, yeah. So, like, for example, like I'm obviously going to climb, climb um, Mont Blanc. There have been no preparation, zero preparation. I got told two weeks ago. Wow. So, you know, it's smaller than Kilimanjaro. The weather's completely different. I'm going to have to learn how to use an ice, ice pick. I mean, I might die. <laughs> what, using the ice pick? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But it's going to be an incredible experience. And I just think if you can put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and be comfortable with it, then, you know, you're going to have things that happen to you and, like, experience things that people can never take away. Like, you've been there. Like, you've done the amount of the subs and, like, yeah. crazy, amazing things like that. And I just think, for me, that is what I live to do. Yeah. Do you think it? Is, do you think that is, I know, I know it's a, it would sort of digress a little bit, but do you think there's certain people that are just maybe – that's our, if you like, that's our purpose for being, that's our calling. Like some people will be a CEO of a company, some people will run up mountains, some people will run down. Do you think that's how life is or do you think, can we take the CEO and can we t- 
take them to the top of a mountain. I think so. You think but so? But you've got to get them to understand the requirement. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's um, one of my friends who came to Kilimanjaro. She basically was like, I'm not going, I can't do it, I'm not going. Anyway, some to Kilimanjaro. Next up, she got off of the ETAP, finished the ETAP. Wow. With eight weeks worth of training. Wow. And she said to me, she was like, never in a million years would I have thought I'd been able to do that. Yeah. Your words of encouragement got me through. And I thought, if Sophie can do it, then I can do it because I've got nothing to complain about. She's the one with the condition that basically is trying to kill her every day. It's incredible. You're, you're truly doing a good job of, uh, of inspiring people. Let's talk about that belief that you give people, though. Do you, and do you think it stems from people's, like, just people have a negative self-image and then they sort of see you and they go, well, she can do it, I can do it? Or what's, the, what's going on there? Well, it's quite funny, really. So when I take on new clients, I don't obviously tell them because that's a bit weird. I wouldn't be like, hi, I'm Sophie, I have CF. You Nobody would do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but if, if they start complaining or they're like, oh, I'm a bit out of breath and I'm like, mate, look. Yeah. I'm going to say this bluntly. I don't care. Really? Unless there's a medical reason that we need to address, I don't care. Like, you're just being complaining because you're being lazy yeah. or, that you, or that you think it's too hard. But actually, in reality, like, if you want to get the results, you have to work bloody hard. Like, you can't just expect it to happen overnight. But I think so many people are willing to get into that phase. So, like, if I can help them and just show to them, or I'll be like, look, I'll do it with you. Yeah. But in an attitude mask. Like, I've done that before. I taught classes in my, in my mask. So I will obviously lay out and explain what they've got to do, but I've done it with them. Hilarious. But in a mask and said, keep up with me. Like, <laughs> I can imagine the faces on some people that would be in that environment or in that class as, as you start to sort of teach it and, and, then, and, and then do it in a mask it must be something quite quite unique I know then they're like oh for god's sake we can't still keep up because I'm obviously competitive and I'm like right who's the fittest one in this room I was like I'm going to train next to you <laughs> Talk to us about some of you. you, you, you let's let's yeah. keep it negative for a while, shall we? And then we'll finish <laughs> off strong. But talk to us about because I I think some of the like people would see you as perhaps almost superhuman, mate. But that's why I want to dig into things that you've tried that maybe haven't gone so well that you've struggled with, and that you've had to sort of that just haven't worked first time. Like you you, you have challenges. The medication, the daily medication, is a challenge. But you're super pr- positive about it and proactive about it. But sometimes. I'm sure there are certain situations where you're like, oh, shit, actually, something's happening here. Do you have those? Oh, 100%. I think I'm, I wish I wish I was superhuman. Yeah. <laughs> Sadly, I'm not. I mean, I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, but, of course, like, you know, to bring reality back down. Yeah. So, I went to a hospital run about two months ago. Literally, just got back from a boot camp holiday. It was bitter than... I've been in a very long time, felt fantastic, went back in with a 15% lump function drop. Wow. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah. bye, great. So I then went away and I was like, they were like, we give you a month. And I was like, oh, great, okay. So I went away and I went back and I was like, oh, 1% increase. This is fantastic. I've literally killed myself for hours for 1%. For 1%. So, you know, I obviously felt really sad and it was a bit like, you know what, this isn't great. Like, this kind of brings back the reality of the severity of CF. Like, yeah. I'm fit, I can run around, I can do all this stuff, I can climb mountains, but it doesn't mean that my health is at its peak. Yeah. So that's where it's where I struggled because then I'm like, well, what else can I do? Like, I'm training at 18,000 feet in an altitude mask for half an hour and I'm okay, I'm not, I'm still alive. Yeah. And I'm doing all this stuff. Like, what more is it going to take for me to get my lung function back up? So I've actually opted to have, which is going to be horrific, a bronchoscopy. Right. Which basically is the liking of a weird scene, I've been told, to Fifty Shades of Grey, where you're tied down, gagged, and put a camera down your throat. Lovely. So, Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, and you have to be awake, which is kind of a bit odd. Wow. And they don't sedate you, so, you know, it's going to be one hell of a ride, but I'm going to try and film it as well. Wow. And when are you going to have that? <laughs> Uh, Mid-August. So I've had to push it back because I said to them, look, I'm climbing a mountain and then it's my birthday, so it's going to have to wait. <laughs> and it, it's not... Uh, hopefully that's not life-threatening as well. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's because it's, it's a choice. So basically, the doctors are trying to make me settle for 85% when three months ago I was 95%. So... Right. You know. So how do you... How do you... What do you do when you get in a situation that perhaps it's tough like that and and not or knocks you down a bit what what's your sort of technique for you know for for picking yourself up mate 
Do you know what? This is really sad, and you can laugh at me. <laughs> <laughs> Already. I actually, I actually just go and sit by the sea. Oh, really? That's yeah, because nice. I live, I live by the sea. Right. And I literally just sit there, and I'm like, right, I'm just going to take like, you know, an hour just to literally not even have my phone on me, just you know, just completely switch off, rest. Yeah. And then kind of rethink my strategy plan. And I think the biggest thing with me, the biggest negative part of me is that I don't rest enough because I get too excited and too like, enthusiastic and I want to run about like I did this morning and like do loads of stuff. But in reality, as you know, we all know, recovery is probably the one of the most underestimated parts of, yeah. you know, pushing forward. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Mate, that's the way you chill out. But talk to us a little bit about, or that's the way you, you sort of get to refocus. Talk to us about your super high energy person. Give us a day in Sophie's life. What does it look like? I mean, that's quite tricky because a day in Sophie's life is very different every single day. But All right. um, I'll give you. I'll just talk you through um, today, if you like. So yeah. I got up at quarter to four. What was fun? I didn't. I got up at quarter to five. Yeah. Um. Then, when I got my coffee, did my drugs, medication <laughs> drugs, you know, same thing. Love it. And then, um, got my breakfast. Then, I drove to work, took my clients, ran down to the station like an absolute loony, oh got the train by the skin of my tea, got to London, ran the other side to my client. Wow. Then, ran back to the station, got on the train, came back down to the back down into Essex and obviously I'm now sitting here with you I have five more clients later wow um, and a bunch of other calls to do and preparation for a big meeting tomorrow so as much as my client base day finishes at 7.30 I'll probably go home and eat because my day is revolves around food and snacks <laughs> and then you know prep for the prep for tomorrow like I'm a big fan of focusing on the 24 hours you have in front of you rather than like the whole week because I think otherwise you then get in a bit of a tears and you're like oh my god I've got this stuff to do and all these people to me are like what am I going to do so I just focus on the 24 hours I've got ahead of me Yeah. and then you know that's how the kind of my day works like uh, I always be up at about quarter to five wow so you've got super long days how much do you sleep how much emphasis do you put on sleep well so this is the thing so because I am up every day really early and especially like in London these days when it's when it gets light at four like and it's sunny and you just want to get out and it's like amazing yeah i try and at least get seven or eight hours so i'll try and be in bed by nine nine thirty ten amazing so um, just because like otherwise i just think my friday i'll just be like an absolute zombie and if they've got a big thing happening at the end of the week like i can't afford to be that person yeah yeah it's uh i think that's that's one of the biggest things it's sort of people seem to get they deteriorate throughout the week don't they they just seem to get worse yeah. and worse and but that's because they neglect sleep as the week goes on right do you know what it is like the other day i was sitting on the tube in london and i was like oh my goodness like it's wednesday and all these people are asleep it's like midday <laughs> i'm like wake up like what are you, like obviously like people are tired and like, different, like people have different lives but i'm like if you don't have the energy and excitement for your life you've got to change it like yeah. it, or if you're living for friday like I love the weekend, don't get me wrong, because like, obviously my weekend's different to my week, but yeah, of course. I don't live for it. Like, I love every day. Like, I just start driving through mad when people are like, oh, I hate my life, I hate my job. And I'm yeah. like, we'll change it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you think there are a lot of people that are in that situation, mate? Is that something that we're seeing more and more, people just sort of hating what they're doing but not changing it? Do you know what? I think there is a large percentage of people that do, but I think there's a larger percentage growing that people are willing to risk things to try and do something that makes them happy yeah yeah i think i think that's i think that's i think both of those things are, are super true i'm i'm seeing a lot more people these days just turn around and go and screw this i'm out you know and people will chuck in jobs and 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 safety nets and all of that stuff just to yeah just to stop being one of those people that's saying i'm gonna do this and and they've actually gone and done it right well that's the thing we live in an age where you can literally earn money from anything yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is actually quite frightening, isn't it? It is. Though. It's terrifying. Yeah. So if you use it to your advantage, it's an amazing opportunity to just be like, "Oh, fuck it, I'm going to go and do it." Yeah, absolutely, mate. Talking of of, of, of careers, you obviously you're you're coaching people. You're you're a businesswoman. You're a speaker as well. When did you start all of these things? When did you start fitness coaching people and and and, and helping people to live better lives? Do you know what? It's when I um, was in hospital with a 50% lung function. Right. Because I thought I, at the time, I was working as a legal secretary and absolutely hated it. 
Um, <laughs> so you've been one of these people. No, awesome. I've been, I've been that person. Amazing. I was that person for like a year and then like, I was like, I'm out. Yeah. I thought, you know what? Like, no, like, I'm not, I'm much, I'm here for a better purpose than to serve somebody else or like yeah. to serve somebody else in that manner. Like, obviously, I want to make a massive impact and help loads of people, but that's different to sitting at an office typing nonsense, basically. Yeah. And I sat there and I was like, no, this is it. Like, this is the start of my life. Like, it's now or never. Like, if I don't act now, then it's going to be never. So I retrained into the business industry, started locally, um, and then started doing loads of, like, filming, TV work, um, online platforms, then gradually started going into presenting and public speaking and all of that kind of areas of work. But it was the best decision I've ever made. And actually, without me having that moment in hospital, I don't know if I would be sitting here today. So, you know, the negative times of your life can be the best times. Yeah. And actually, even my sister that you might know, because she actually lives in Dubai. What? Um, yeah, she's a personal trainer out there. You might know her. Whoa. Um, why, is it, why haven't we had her on the show? Look her up, Anna Holmes. She's oh, amazing. Well, her and her boyfriend have set up this amazing new um, training business together. Oh. Um, I think because you know um, Tom Otten, don't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah so I know him too. And um, he knows Anna's boyfriend. So. Ah. Yeah, I think shout out to Tom Otten. He's the one that actually sort of connected us somehow a few months ago. Yeah, back. you know, he mess- I messaged him and I was like, do you yeah. know this guy? And he was like, this yeah. was my doing. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. How funny. Yeah, he's great. It's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, so that that's how, you, that's how you live your life. How much time do you spend public speaking? Talk to us about your public speaking. What does that entail? Where can people see you public speaking? Um, so it varies really. Like, I went through a period of time where I was doing it every week. Now it's not so often just because other things have taken place and I'm building other areas of work to facilitate it. Yeah. Um, but I've uploaded everything on my YouTube. So YouTube channel? Uh, uh, Sophie Grace Holmes, just my name. There we go. And folks, before I forget, go and check out Sophie on her Instagram. She's very active over there, which is also Sophie Grace Holmes as well. So people can go and see all of your stuff. I love the content you put out. Put out loads of different stuff from workouts to just cool shots of what's going on and i think that's um i think that's something that you're doing a really good job of mate but even speaking about that social media it's it's something that i mean i guess that helps you to create your brand but you're massively dedicated as well you must put a lot of time into it yeah i mean it is like a full-time job sometimes (laughs) (laughs) but i'm so determined to change and impact as many people as i can and obviously it's a big platform most people use it and hopefully if i can continue to grow it you know, yeah. I can get out there more and, you know, my manager is actually trying to get me out to Dubai soon Amazing. to um, do stuff out there. So, oh, that'd, mate, it'd come be, out there. It'll be then, super uh, we'll good. Uh, we definitely will. Let's go back a little bit because we, we skipped a little bit on Mont Blanc. You go to Mont Blanc in two weeks to try and summit Mont Blanc. This is um, epic. I'm actually, I'm actually leaving on Saturday. But you leave on Saturday. On Saturday. <laughs> Talk to us. How did this challenge come about and give us a few details about it? Okay, so basically the challenge came about in because my manager has another client who's doing it. It's his trip um, because they're fundraising for um, children who have parents who are either abusive or have problems with alcohol. Right. And basically there was a slot that came up and we're friends and he was like, oh, so do you want to come? Like, I know this is right your street and actually we could do with your mindset dedication to get us all up there. So wow. I was like, oh, okay, like I was supposed to be going on holiday, but I'm sure... I can put that back a week to simply come and climb a mountain. And obviously, I love that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm never going to turn my nose up an opportunity like that. Yeah, that's amazing. So, and is that is that often how you sort of choose your challenges? Like, what? I mean, that seems like quite a random way for something to come up, but it fits in very well with your, with your personality. How do you go about choosing what you're going to do? Do you know what? I choose something that I don't think I can achieve. Right. So, you know, by, by that, what I mean is sitting here right now, if I wanted to go and run 100 kilometers through the Sahara Desert, yeah. I possibly would die. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. So, You'd be no, okay. I'd get there. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah. So, basically, I do plan to do that next year, but I would choose something that I have to put in the hard work to achieve. So, you know, I set goals that are so big that I can't achieve them right now. Right. But in time, I definitely will be able to. So that's how I go along. But I also try and do things that I've never done before or places I've never been. Yeah, I think that's a super, super nice criteria. What have you, what have you got after Mont Blanc then? Where, could, where do we expect to see you? Is there anything else lined up for this year or big goals for next year? Or big yeah, challenges? Yeah, so I'm climbing the Himalayas in October. Wow. 
and I'm taking my dad with me, which is going to be wonderful. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Which is really nice. Yeah. So he's really excited about that, so that'll be really cool. Um, and then I'm hoping in February to do 100 kilometers through the Sahara. Wow. Um, and I managed to recruit a friend of mine to come with me, so. Oh, such, such willing good. friends you have. I know. Well, well he don't, I don't think he's quite realised the intensity of the challenge, but um, he's crazy enough to accept it, so I'm just going to go with that for now. <laughs> Mate, I want to just go through some pretty quick fire questions yep. just so that we can have a little bit of fun here. Best book that you've read recently or favorite book you've read recently? Um, the Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Mark, Mark Manson, very good yep. book. He was actually back on, uh, I listened to him on James Alter's show the other day, which is a great podcast, which I listen to and people should. Amazing. Yeah, he's a su- super cool guy. Podcast, you listen to podcast, favorite podcast? Um, I haven't listened to loads, but I've been listening to um, Gary, I can't pronounce his last name. Vaynerchuk. Yes, him. Very good for your business, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, he gives a lot of, uh, lot of good ideas. Quite, quite aggressive as well. Do you spend yeah. time watching TV? Do you know what? I don't even know how to use the TV at home. Awesome. So, I'm going <laughs> to say no. And mate, another quick question. Food, best cheap meal. What do you crave the most? Um, probably a burger. Really? Any like any particular burger. brand? Do you know what? I'm not fussy with the brand, so long as it's really, really good. <laughs> or a good pizza is also good. Like a pizza pilgrims in London is a pretty good shout. Yeah. <laughs> pizza. I think I actually think pizza is one of my favourite ones there as well. One thing we haven't spoke spoken about, which we can we, we should spend the la- last few minutes talking about a little bit, is how do you? How do you fuel yourself? How do you eat? Because I think this is a big topic. Like people are going to go and check you out. They're going to see you're in great shape. You're doing all these things. You're 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 sort of you're living with with cystic fibrosis. So you've obviously got your nutrition well in check. Give us a little bit of a a, a, a once over of how you eat. Okay, so this is what I call the silver lining of cystic fibrosis. Right. So I have to eat a minimum of three thousand calories a day to simply not lose weight. Wow. So. I know, it's literally amazing. Although it is really hard work also. I'm not going to yeah. say it's not. Because obviously you know what it's like. If you're trying to eat 80% healthily, it is really hard work to get that number. Yeah. But because of my digestive system, I have to. Um, so basically I'll get up in the morning. If, like for example, a day like today and I'm really busy running around, I'll have porridge, but normally I'd have eggs. Right. Um, and then I'm the queen of snacks. So I'll either bake my snacks, which I do quite a lot, and then give them out to my clients as well because then they can snack healthily. And, but my, the key is to make the snack taste naughty, but it be healthy. So, so how I do you that do down that? To how do you do so that? I, I gave my clients some brownies this morning, and they were completely healthy, but they tasted really naughty. <laughs> so basically, like, just, just playing around with the ingredients and making sure that – because I love food, like, and I love – like chocolate and I've got a really sweet tooth and I've got this client actually quickly who her chef makes like healthy Snickers healthy bounty bars healthy fudge and every single time I go around she's like Sophie you know where the snack bridge is off you go like, oh, it's amazing really um, yeah so obviously I'll have loads of snacks on me like that or like bits and bobs of fruit but like in the day in, for lunchtime for example I'll always have like some form of protein like chicken or fish with, with a carb yeah. and loads and loads of veg um, just bulk out my meals with loads of veg and then in the afternoon, I'll have a shake or like make a smoothie with Greek yogurt, avocado, frozen berries, and all of that kind of thing. And then dinner um, will be some form of carb, protein, fats before I go to bed. And if I'm still hungry, then I'll still eat, basically. Yeah, I mean, to get, are, are you strict that you get that much food in? You get over 3,000 calories in every day? I mean, probably not every day, just because, you know, it, it's kind of a chore. And also, I spend half of my day eating, which is fantastic. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but we don't always have time to be doing that. Yeah, um, half, half of your day so, eating and the rest of it pre- preparing the food. Well, that's the problem and, like, that's the thing. So, you know, give and take 3,000 calories, but, you know, I can tell quite quickly if I've lost weight, so then I'll just have to start eating more or go out for those of dinners. <laughs> I think, right, yeah. I think you. I think people will be not very envious of the fact that it that you have to take up to 80 tablets a day but I think quite envious of the fact that you are on you can naturally just eat over 3,000 calories a day will make a lot of people very happy but I have no doubt that like you said even if you do have a sweet tooth you're you're making sure that you're eating healthy food whereas a lot of the time people are just filling up on food that's obviously not that great aren't they? Yeah 
Well, that's a problem, especially because that's what the doctors tell people to have to do, just to get the calories and just eat. Yeah. And that is why I likened myself to a African child when I was younger, because basically that's what I looked like, because my stomach just couldn't deal with it, because it was loads of sugar. Yeah. And that's how, like, why I get loads of messages from people online saying to me, what, how would you eat? Because we don't look like that. And I'm like, well, I bet you eat loads of sugar. They're like, yeah, but that's the only way. And yeah. I'm like, it's really not, like... We need to re-educate. Yeah, it, 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 that's another really interesting conversation, isn't it? it uh, about sort of what's probably been put out by certain health bodies or health authorities, which is I, I had a client who, who, who had some, some heart issues and it brought me the food that he'd been told to eat by the hospital and it was just absolute carnage. And I was like, oh my God, this is what's been dished out to people. And I, 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 it's, it's so obvious, sad. Yeah. And I mean, it's obviously the problem is global as well. We're, we're experiencing Dubai. You probably have it in the UK, the US. We know they've got problems as well. I think, yeah, it's an interesting time, isn't it? Yeah, no, literally insane. But hopefully between a few of us, we can change that. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Talking about change and talking about the future, Give us an insight. Where, where will you be in five years? What will you be doing in five years, Sophie? Oh, wow. That's a big yeah, it's question. Deep. Well, it's that's deep. It's so deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping that I will be... Because my plan is to be able to travel a lot with my job. Yeah. So whether it be with fitness, whether it be public speaking, whether it be presenting. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to be working, doing that around the world, um, and also fueling challenges. So... We're working with a few brands at the moment that are happy to support me in whatever challenges I want to do. So hopefully I'll be able to be doing loads of those in some amazing locations as well. That's amazing. And, and I'm sure you'll be making a huge impact to a lot of people as well, which is even better, right? Yeah, that's what I hope so. Absolutely. Mate, let's wrap up. We've got one final question that I always ask our guests, or Andre, who's actually on holiday and can't be with me on the show today. He normally asks this question. But the question is this. You've obviously learned a lot of things along the way. If you could sum everything up in one piece of advice that you're going to give to someone about life, living the best life, and really achieving things, what would that one piece of advice be? So I would say to them to have the courage to find their adventure, to challenge themselves, and set goals that scare them, but don't give up when the going gets tough, because that is where the change happens. Awesome. Mate, I don't think, we don't even need to add to that. You've absolutely nailed it. You've wrapped the show up absolutely perfectly. What can I say? For me. No, mate, I really appreciate your time, Sophie. It's been absolutely awesome talking to you. And I do appreciate, as you said, that you have a massively busy schedule. So to take time out to share your story with the people that listen, all of our listeners that download the Health Fitness Podcast, I really do appreciate what you're doing. And I think you should definitely come out to Dubai. You should definitely come and see us. We should all work out together and we should record another podcast. Oh, 100%. I'm there. So thank you so much for having me. Not at all. And, uh, the next time we'll be in person, so be ready. Absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Sophie Holmes. As we said there, Sophie, people can check you out on Instagram, Sophie Grace Holmes. And I'm sure if, they, if people do get in touch with you and ask you all those questions about what's going on and why your belly looks like it does, <laughs> you'll be super you obliged. Know, summing it up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My dear, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.